Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are so excited to be launching the Other Art Fair virtual editions this year. Um, and so this is our first conversation with AMFM for our Friday late programming. Um, this is our lobby, which is very exciting and feels like exactly what a real fair would feel like. So we're gonna go ahead and enter the room. Yeah, so AMFM have curated our Friday Room 3 um, like special features artist booth. Um, so in the room, there are 25 different independent and emerging artists from around the world who were selected to participate in this launch virtual editions. And in AMFM's booth, we have an amazing collection of mostly Chicago-based artists um, in this booth that has been curated by the wonderful Kira McKissick from AMFM. And AMFM are a partner uh, we worked with in the past in Chicago at the live fairs, and we're delighted that they will be joining us on uh, our first digital venture um, and showing in a slightly different form, but the work and artists they're working with are still uh, exceptionally high caliber and the booth and the curation and thought behind everything is pretty spectacular. This booth, a lot of the artists throughout have used sound and recordings and the link features of uh, Kunst Matrix, the site that the fair is hosted on, to share a bit more about the work. And this booth is pretty special in the fact that every piece has a sound recording from the artist as well as a Spotify playlist with music that's attached to the work. Um, so I'd love to bring on Kira to tell us a bit more about um, AMFM, the booth curation, how it started, what the process was like. Um, so if you wanna unmute and start your video and tell us a bit more. Hello. Hello, happy Friday. Hi, happy Friday. I'm so glad it's Friday. I'm excited, <laughs> not just uh, about it being Friday, but about the booth launch today. So super, super grateful that we've been able to be a part of the fair again this year. I definitely miss the hustle and bustle of the in-person fairs and seeing all the people setting up and getting ready to go. But this has been a really wonderful opportunity and experience being able to do something virtually in 3D and in virtual reality and be able to really add some really nice elements to it to be able to get that in-person fair kind of vibe. Was this the first uh, virtual exhibit you've done because you've been doing a lot of exhibits throughout the pandemic yeah um, socially distant and safe but still kind of showing work has this been the first way you've shown in this capacity yes this has been the first way i've shown in this capacity the other shows have been like appointment only in person kind of exhibitions but i really had a lot of fun with this and it's got me thinking about how i wish to curate and extend further exhibitions in the future i think that this whole model is a really great extension of what a show can be as well too. So it's also great for accessibility for people who aren't necessarily in Chicago and can't come to my shows in person. I can maybe offer something virtually for them or just add more pieces and do more things. So this won't be the last time that I, I learn or do something like this. So thanks for the opportunity to learn something new and present something in a way I haven't before. Of course. And can you tell us a bit about, I know a lot of these artists are ones you've worked with uh, in the past or shown in real life. What was the, the curatorial process like for you of choosing the artist, choosing the work, thinking about the booth? Yeah, I think something that we've always been known for at our booths at the other art fair is that most of the work is just completely splashed with color. It's usually very bright bright booth that people are able to come and check out and it features solely emerging artists and I've worked with a ton of these artists before whether it has been at the other art fair I think uh, Marcella Eli, Caroline Liu has shown before, uh, Andrea Coleman as well and Roland Santana, Beata Shisnowska has shown in the past before and I sprinkled some new folks in. I actually discovered Barry Johnson from the Saatchi website. I was looking through to see about discovering some new artists 
artist and really fell in love with the color pops and some of the palettes that he used and was really drawn to that. So I wanted to include him. And then Romero Silva, I've worked with before. Um, we did a Pink Things pop up for our anniversary show a couple of years back. And I just love the, the striking shapes of the piece. And I've been particularly getting more into abstraction and really how people personify um, different themes or subjects through shapes and color. And I didn't know that the big large piece on turquoise that you see there with the pink blocks, those blocks represent people. And um, also this conversation about locality well too so really wanted to think about that so I worked with some people I had worked with for our AMF FM collection that we have on Saatchi and wanted to bring some of those artists back and show what they've been up to since we presented them last year amazing yeah and music is a big part of what AMFM does you do performances and events and kind of this this booth has music incorporated in it a bit. Can you talk a bit more about the music as part of AMFM and that overlap of the yeah. art? Uh, so AMFM, initially it stood for Arts Music Fashion Magazine. So we do a lot of different things. We work with interdisciplinary artists. We were hosting a lot of music performances at our gallery space. So music and art for us go hand in hand. And it was really a way for us to do a pop-up event, but keep people in a space and engage them in a different way, rather outside of just simply looking at art. We felt like bringing in musicians and adding music to it really elevated the platform. And it brought different people from different communities and different backgrounds into the space with art lovers who could kind of interpret and interact with the work together. And I really wanted to bring some of that musical element to our virtual booth because what we were doing at the fairs in person were we would do activations and bring musicians to the fair to do actual performances. I think in 2018, the first one that we did was one of my favorite ones. We had dancers and a trumpet player, um, Sam Trump, and they were walking around the entire fair at different times and just playing music and like dancing. So it was kind of out of nowhere and people were able to come and crowd around and look at and see something really cool. And then we had a tap dancer and a harpist last year who came and did some performance in a classical violinist who would kind of transform those classical hits into hip hop music and the tap dancer would tap along with it. So I was thinking, how can I bring some of these elements that we're known for with the other art fair to the booth? So I asked each artist to submit a song that they felt resonated with either their piece or something that they like to listen to when they're working on art or something that related to their practice. So they each submitted a song and I compiled it in a Spotify playlist. So you can kind of listen to it while you're looking at the artwork or just listen to it on your own and vibe with it. That's a great, great playlist. Um, got some Aretha Franklin on there, <laughs> some Boards of Canada. Uh, there's some really good stuff. So um, even some, I think, J. Cole. So it's really a mix of different types of music. It was, yeah, it's a good mixture. <laughs> and were there any challenges that you felt that were different from like hanging work in a, in a physical space? Um, I think that the booth itself really mimicked the type of booth that we normally have. And I was really trying to play with space and play with like kind of salon style, like one of the walls on the left or right side is really like a salon style kind of wall. I definitely had some other pieces that were like on the, the cutting room floor that I wanted to include because thinking about size, like when you see a size um, on like uh, dimensions list or something like that, it's hard to actually visualize how large it's really going to be. So I would put something up and be like, whoa, this is actually really big and trying to figure out how to place things next to each other. But outside of that, I don't think that there was too much difficulty. I really wanted to create a flow and have different pieces complement and work off of one another, different color palettes work off of each other as well. Um, but I would say it was a pretty fairly easy way to set it up. And I definitely had a good time putting it together. I moved stuff around a lot and <laughs> eventually came to this. Amazing. Well, I'd love to bring in our first artist. Um, if that's good with you. Yes. Um, so yeah, you were saying you found Barry on Saatchi Art, pretty incredible interdisciplinary artist. Um, I feel like I recognize his paintings most from seeing them so much on Saatchi. <laughs> uh, I would love to, yeah, we can click in on that, Tasha, uh, his work. Um, 
and yeah, and if you click on the pieces as well too, something that I really wanted to include was to have you hear from the artists because a lot of times when I'm at the fair, I like to tell stories about the artists that I know or like what their influences are. And I feel like that really draws people in and they are more interested in like looking at the work or potentially even buying the work um, after learning a bit about that. So we have all of those audio clips from artists about at least one of their pieces um, so that you can dive a bit deeper. It's amazing. Hi, <laughs> yeah, Barry, would you like to turn your video on and unmute and join us to tell us a bit about this work and your practice and what you do? Yeah. Perfect. Um, first, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. It's truly an honor. And looking at the other artists, this work is incredible. And I'm really grateful to be able to speak about it. Um, so my name is Barry Johnson. I am an interdisciplinary surrealist working across all mediums, um, paint, performance, film, installation. The work here is a part of my studio practice. The one on the left side with the color and the black and white and the male with the space fading is made with house paint. That's 100%. So most of the work. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, great. Uh, it's made with latex house paint, so it's all 100% house paint um, that's on that can, it's on oil paper, and the one next to it, while it may look like it is a drawing or a charcoal drawing, it's made 100% out of iron oxide petals. Mm -hmm. So this is part of a self-destructing series that I do about um, racism and social injustices, um, primarily featuring, featuring Black men. But everything on that canvas is made with iron pellets. So no sealants used on it. And what happens is over time, all of the petals will fall off. So it's like a literal self-destructing artwork. And the reason why I didn't put any sealant on it with the hope of everything falling off is because I'm hoping that by the time 25, 30 years from now when everything falls off, we won't be dealing with a lot of the problems that we're dealing with today around racism, social injustice, gender inequality, and everything else. Thank you. Yeah, that's really amazing. I think I was really drawn to the work at first because I didn't know that it was made from iron oxide. I was drawn in because I thought it was charcoal, or even it looks like it could be, you know how you when you use those old photocopy machines and you put like a body part on it and you get this scan? It looks right, like it could have exactly. been, <laughs> yeah, it looks like it could have been that, and I just love kind of the debris and distortion. I would be curious about how you started working with iron oxide. Like, was it an experimental process? Was it something that you had heard about and wanted to try yourself? Um, and how did the medium really speak to you? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that. It's actually the first time I've been asked this. <laughs> that's surprising. <laughs> and it's nice to meet you also. In you person, well. Kind of. All love. Um, so, this came about through uh, one of the series I work in is with a bunch of found objects. So um, just looking at my artwork on Sashi, you'll see that some of the paintings will have glass on top of them. Some of them will have roofing material on top of them. They'll have sticks, they'll have red duct tape on top of them. I love working with found objects. And I was out doing a residency in Hawaii and I started making these large drawings on the beach out of the sand. And I thought it was really cool because as the waves rose over the day, the artwork would literally disappear. And when it comes to, you know, again, going back to the idea of racism and like the future of it and like where we're at now, confronting it head on and a complete paradigm shift and like how we're looking at the landscape of social justice, I wanted to be able to replicate that on a canvas. So I started looking around and I saw that charcoal was cool but, you know, again, it can be made so that it sticks to the canvas forever. So I came across iron oxide and was like, first I was using volcanic ash and I found iron oxide after that. And I loved it. And I love like how it feels. And that's how it became alive. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's awesome. Especially thinking about impermanent works and such like that, especially for someone to like add that to their collection and be able to watch the, the growth over time and see how it changes. I think a lot of times we're often talking about preserving artwork and making sure that it stays intact. But with you having the intention of having it change is, is really interesting. And I've never heard someone do something like that before. So I'm curious, I'm going to check back in in 20, 20 years or so and see how the work looks. I'm yeah. also 
Yeah, yeah, Corey. <laughs> to that point about it disappearing and like it changing, I really had an idea of that. Um, watching how um, my favorite artist, uh, Robert Rauschenberg, bought an artwork from William de Kooning, which of course is one of the biggest artists that we know now, and he spent a month erasing the work and then made a brand new work. And I was like, whoa, that was so really cool what he did. And I, of course, like not wanting to copy an artist, you know, wanted to find my own take on it. So that's how that was born. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that little anecdote. And also it speaks to your other piece uh, where, and a lot of the other pieces that I saw in Hisachi too, where there's a bit of distortion within the piece as well. So because it's house paint, were you peeling? I know that you said that you use a specific tool that wasn't a paintbrush to kind of smear and mimic that ability of like distorting things. I would love to learn more about this piece in particular. Yeah, so this is part of my longest running portrait series. It's the series that I'm known for the most is since 2016, every year I've been finding a different way to distort faces. Like I told you about the found objects. At one point I was doing it with just straight paint. It was anything else. And last year I came across this whole idea, like where we were at with everything with um, the demonstrations that were taking place and you know, America being locked inside, the world being locked inside, everything coming to life. It was like this really explosive moment. And it was kind of the reassemblance of black identity. Like we were for the first time ever becoming noticed. So I wanted to start working based off in the middle of that, I started painting and in one night I made this whole piece because I wanted it initially to be a bit of an abstraction with the color, I wanted to be dead on about the black and white issues around black and white that were happening in life. And I wanted to center it on a black man, which of course we saw the video, unfortunately, of what happened with George Floyd. So all of this was made in a real kind of meditative moment and it came to life. And I, I did that same week, I did five more. It was all around this, but this was the most, this is my favorite piece I've ever made in my life. And I've got literally a thousand plus artwork. So I am really in love with this piece. Yes, I love like the entire series. I would be curious too, are these real people that you're depicting or is it like an idea that you come up with for a person in your head? Yeah, it's a bit of both. So um, I'm very big on sampling from the community. So with the uses of like TikTok or of course like Instagram, Facebook, if I am looking at artists or just um, individuals that I find, you know, by my weird ideas to have unique looks, um, I always reach out to them, like, you know, I'd like to preserve your essence in some way. And I never take an exact uh, look alike of whatever the person is. It's kind of that creative freedom to change colors or I'll change their body position. It's a bit of, you know, sampling is the same thing that we're born hip hop and just kind of doing that in a painter's fashion to assemble a narrative that ends up ultimately getting painted. I love that metaphor of, to hip hop as well. And that really ties into my next question about your writing background. I know that you're also a writer to be able to say a metaphor like that. Does writing ever find itself inside of your pieces or do they ever speak to one another or are they separate practices? Yes, literally that and everything makes up my practice. I know that there's this whole idea of like, you know, inspiration, and maybe that's attached to a certain individual. I like to stay hyper focused and ferociously curious about what's happening within modern life, but not capturing it through a pop art. I more so a, a, a continual study of what's happening within the black community. So to the point of writing and attaching it to this, a lot of pieces originally will have words in them that ultimately get painted over or the intention of not necessarily making sure that every line within the piece in front of you is straight. Like the, it, it's intentionally off. And you know, the writing plays such a part in that. And of course, like music, like I love jamming out to new music, all types of music and just vibing out and trying to capture the energy the artist was making whenever they created a piece and repurposing that, attaching it to my own and making something new as well. So I'm curious about what words would be underneath this piece then. At this there, time? Yeah, is it, does this piece here that we're looking at have any words underneath it? Yeah, so this doesn't have any words underneath it, but 
it was really written across numerics, which was again, like the video of George Floyd, eight minutes, 40, uh, 47 seconds. So that is the essential data that wrote the code for this. If there were words that would have been attached to this at the time it was made, because again, this is right in the middle of everything, you know, it wouldn't be the nicest of words because it was like pure energy and just trying to showcase like what exactly life looked like through the lens of a black man looking at how life is pushing to it at that moment. So more than anything, it would just be to pay attention. You know, that would be it. Simply pay attention, look at what, look at me, look at what I'm doing, understand, learn, have empathy, have apathy, you know, those type of languages. Yeah, I'm definitely glad that you're able to, to be able to channel that and like work through whatever experiences you were feeling through that. And I'm sure as a black man that affected you in a different way that it affected me as well too. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. I wanna know before we jump into the next artist, do you have anything going on, anything coming up next that you wanna share with the, the folks on here? I know you have a show at Jacob Lawrence Gallery in Seattle right now. Yep, yep. Yeah, so I actually had three openings last night. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm extremely grateful to be able to do what I do, and um, I, I love to be able to do it. But I, I just uh, painted a large mural in a museum that's out here in Seattle. Um, I was just a finalist for, like, the largest award in the Pacific Northwest um, last year, and now I'm in the show that you're saying at the Jacob Lawrence Gallery that's there um, speaking to a callback of language. I just got to fabricate the art that went across the entire exterior of a five-story building out here in Seattle. It was the biggest project I've done to date. It was such an amazing, and I'm so extremely grateful to have done it. But written across it is like a lot of lines that look like very cryptic, just kind of swipes of a brush. But in reality, I had written atop of it sky's no limit. And then I just went in and I just started cutting the words apart. So no one would know that until everyone knows it was called this exact moment. But that's how it was done. But looking at it, it was just like a bunch of scribbles. That's awesome. Congratulations on all the, the accolades. Thank you for spending time with us today. I know it sounds like you're pretty busy. Appreciate it. I appreciate you also. Thank you again. That line, um, ferociously curious. Just <laughs> really resonates i mean you know all the the difference in these two works but the similarities and the scale of the projects you're working on and the amount of people look at your work on sachi it's the amount of work you're making is incredible um so yeah thank you for joining us today i genuinely appreciate it thank you so much um, the next artist we're going to bring on is Caroline's work, which is to the left and also fits, as you were saying, the vibrancy and colour of the booth. Her work is so textural and has so much depth and is also so unique, but there's, there's other elements as well and themes that I'm sure you guys will touch on, um, but it would be great to bring Caroline on and onto video now. Hi, hi, Caroline. How are you doing? Good, good. This, yeah. was, this is really, um, this has been really fun and interesting to listen to and hear about Barry's work. And, you know, I'm happy to be on here and talk a little bit more about my work and everything. Um, so yeah. Always excited to to work with you. We've had Caroline in the fair since the first one that we did, and each time we bring her back, people just fall in love with the work more and more. And they're always really, really large pieces. Usually, she yeah. works on such a large scale. Um, I'm really curious about, especially this one. I wish that we could have the fair in real life because people can touch this piece if they want to. And I think that that's what's so amazing about you working with different textures and like incorporating fur into the work. And oftentimes you don't get to touch artwork. So kind of how did you come to that decision to start working with fur and why do you want to include some tactileness of it? Yeah, so I think it's important to kind of like give a little background information about like who I am and kind of the work that I, the 
work that I create and why I create it and why the textual element is so important to me. Um, so in my work, I kind of blend together painting, um, fabric. Um, I also um, sew a lot of large scale plushies as well. Um, and um, I paint murals. So uh, but just giant versions of my already giant paintings. <laughs> Um, and so my work really talks about uh, the experiences that I've had in the last decade, um, having two concussions uh, back to back, and then using my work as a sort of um, way to document my life and document my memories. And through that, I kind of explored a little bit deeper of my identity and kind of the things that made me um, unique and um, how my viewpoints um, are seen from a different lens than um, most people. And so through my art and through the exploration of memory loss, I uh, kind of tapped into a part of my identity that I had always kind of suspected, but never really allowed myself to um, fully think about or, or talk about. And so finally, um, last year, actually, I was diagnosed as autistic. And so my work in the last year and a half or so has really um, been talking about um, the experiences that I have um, being a person that was undiagnosed for 31 years of my life and being diagnosed for a year and a half and kind of the ways in which the undiagnosed part of my life um, gave way to a lot of loss and trauma and um, working through those emotions to the emotions that I feel now, which is more joy and allowing myself to be more expressive to the things that like uh, make me happy and um, the things that allow me to communicate a little bit more how I'm feeling. And so with that, that's really when a lot of my paintings turned to three dimensionality. Um, so you could really like uh, reach out and you could touch it. You can, um, have these plushies that kind of envelop you or um, it's not just an act of looking but an act of um, changing the way that the the conversation and language exists between you and an artwork yeah thank you so much for sharing that context as well and i've always been curious particularly about this piece i think someone asked me how it is that you incorporate the fur is it on top of the painting or do you cut it out and then place it <laughs> on there like what is the process like yeah so it's actually it's pretty nerve-wracking um i buy a giant um like two yards of fabric and then i place it on top of it pin it to the back and then I kind of just cut away around the outline of where I want to put it. Um, so it's a lot of like, like looking, putting where like the, the line is where my finger is, snip, looking, snip, looking, snip. <laughs> and then if I make one like cut that's wrong, it won't work anymore. So it's literally cut in the shape of the exact painting that I have underneath it. Um, and then the little parts where they're like in the center, where there's just like little tufts coming out. Um, those again, I take from the scraps of the cutaways and then I like shape it in and stick it in there. Wow, that's such a, I didn't, I had no idea that you were doing it like that. Such a Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's hard too, cause uh, when you cut fur, like the majority of it falls out. Yeah. So at the end of it, I kind of become like cookie monster. Like I'm full of fur <laughs> and I have to like lit roll my face. <laughs> oh my goodness. You become one of your, your plushies or something like that. Yeah. 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 And I'm also super interested about kind of the surrealist and like symbolism that lies beneath the piece. I know in the audio, you talked about what the snake represented and what the crow represented, or crow, or is it a raven represented? Raven. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Darkness. <laughs> But um, I'm really curious to hear you talk more about that. Yeah, so I've always been really connected to animals. Um, and I think that they provide a lot of like symbolism and a lot of um, narrative based ideas than uh, just like portraits. So the snake and the raven um, kind of talk about the balance between um, joy and loss, and then the balance between um, a past self and a new self. 
And so the snake kind of represents the idea of like rebirth, of um, traveling in a new direction, um, seeing what's next, shedding your skin. Um, and, and for me, it doesn't necessarily mean getting rid of your past self, but bringing it along with you. Um, you're like a fresh new version of yourself, but you're still yourself, which is very important to hold on to. And then the raven in this case is kind of uh, a little ominous, a little bit, um, the things that are lurking near you <laughs> that might just fly in your path and like caught you or beak you or something. Um, but that doesn't necessarily have to be um, something so terrible that you have to run from. It could just exist there with your knowledge of it. Um, and so this piece, it's kind of interesting. I, I painted it right before the pandemic hit um, and it's called, Oh Hell, Hello. And it's kind of like, Oh Hell, <laughs> Hello, you're here. You know, I see you in front of me, but I'm just going to kind of trudge through. Um, and the way that I like to say it is like my brand uh, of sadness is sparkly. <laughs> so this painting, like it has a lot of sparkles, it has a lot of fur, a lot of bright colors. And it's kind of like that acceptance of it and um, finding your way through it, through little piece, pieces of joy, little pieces of um, understanding of yourself and like guiding your way through it. Yeah, I definitely can see that, like the vibrancy and whatnot really do evoke feelings of joy, but just knowing you and like your work and the things, that, the subject matter that you deal with, um, there are some deeper underlying things that lie within the work. And especially, yeah. I think this is one of the last, this piece was in an art show that was at a space in Chicago called Vault Gallery, and mm -hmm. it was featuring women muralists that you curated yourself, mm -hmm. and it was on top of a wall, so it wasn't like your typical white cube. All of the walls were kind of painted as though they were murals, and then the pieces were placed on top of it. Um, mm -hmm. So I just really loved seeing work in that way before, and just yeah. really, really I, inspired me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like there's just. Um there's just a language of it, the language of color and then the spaces it, that it occupies. Um, for me, color and visuals and tactile sense um, is definitely more of a communication tool than actual like speaking itself. Um, and so when I curated that show, I really wanted the, the whole gallery to be enveloped in color and texture. Um, and so there kind of made it to a point where you were um, inside the space, like you're inside my little imaginary world. Um, and so, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> show that you did also where you had the blue walls, you really do transform a space oh. with your work and like invite people in, even down to like painted couches and painted like materials on the couch, the tables and things like that. Like it's really, really immersive. And I love that. And I'm also maybe like the last question. I know that you just did like a, a really big move and moved out to New Mexico. Yeah. And how have you been doing with that and how has it impacted your practice? Have there been a, a difference in focus or have you been able to really slow down and create work like you set out to? Yeah, well, it, I love that you're asking this question. Um, also because this painting here, Oh Hell, Hello, um, was kind of my nod to missing New Mexico and missing being in the mountains. I was so homesick when I painted this painting. Um, I was really thinking about um, nature and space and time um, and solitude, um, kind of allowing myself to get to a better understanding of who I am uh, individually and also who I am as a person um, outside of myself in the community, in the art world, um, in the world world. <laughs> um, and so this painting was kind of, um, you can see in the, in the um, faces and the portraits, you can see a couple of mountains, um, my idea of landscapes. Um, and it's also marked with both of the portraits are crying. And so all of my paintings feature people who are crying. So all of my eyes are um, crying and they're all kind of tap onto uh, deeper levels of understanding through each of the narratives that each painting is, is talking about. Um, and so when I did finally move back here um, in September, September of 2020, I moved back here. Um, it's been, 
so wonderful for my soul. <laughs> um, it's probably been the best move that I could make individually and for my art career. I was doing so much work over the last couple of years, um, constantly doing projects, constantly in shows, constantly making new work, um, doing a bunch of murals. And it was wonderful. And I'm so appreciative of that time. Um, but it was a lot. And I definitely experienced a lot of burnout from it. And subsequently, my art suffered. Um, I didn't really want to paint. I didn't really want to, I didn't have a lot of ideas. I was just very, very tapped out. And so when I moved down here, I wanted to make it a point to spend more time in nature and spend more time um, really understanding myself as an artist and the kind of work that I want to create. Um, and so since then, I've been here for about six months again, and I'm working on like 17 paintings right now. <laughs> and it's probably the best work I've ever made. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Well, I'm so happy to hear that you're you're feeling like you're thriving out there and doing what you need for your soul and whatnot. And yeah. it's interesting that you made this before the pandemic and we're craving like solitude and nature. And then so much of what we've experienced in this past year is exactly just that. I feel like a lot of people have retreated to nature and mm -hmm. kind of got grounded in that way. You know, I was going hiking all the time, biking and stuff. So Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think of any of the shows in the virtual edition, um, shows, any of the artwork in the virtual editions, this is the piece I want to see most in person, just for that yeah. tactile yeah. nature mm -hmm. and having seen um, images of the group show you curated together in, oh well, no, it was a two-person show in the summertime. Um, and... Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. The one at Roots and Culture. Oh, yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. To just like yeah. see images of the work in person and like the thought of being able to touch it and interact mm -hmm. with it and get close to see the texture. Um, and I choose, uh, I choose really soft fur too. So it's luxurious to like rub <laughs> your hands through. <laughs> uh, even worse. Yeah. Um, it's beautiful work. And thank you so much for telling us more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Our last artist today is the artist to the left. Again, very colorful. And this is work by Marcelo Eli, who has also worked with AMFM for a while and I believe shown at previous, the other art fair editions. Yeah, so Marcelo, if you wanna join us with your camera. Oh, hi. Hello, well, hello there. You're sitting in front of my favorite piece. <laughs> Yeah, so this piece is by Marcelo. He has two pieces in the show, actually. So there's this one, and then there's a smaller framed piece. Um, super different styles, I think, but definitely still within the Marcelo vein. And I love, love, love how you incorporate, you know, folklore and mythology and different historical elements within your work. Do you want to talk a bit about that and just let people know about your practice a bit? Yeah, um, for me, the uh connecting with this sense of mythology and uh, legend, I think allows the work to time travel in a way where it can create a tether with uh, archeology span and art history, and then putting it into a new context, which would create it in a way that it makes it more contemporary and bringing it more to the forefront, and then revitalizing those narratives and legends and putting them into question of what is reality and what, what isn't. What do you think is reality and what do you think it isn't? <laughs> well, reality is just based on perception. That's true. You do have a lot of layers and things that you include in your piece outside of just like different forms within it where there's a story being told in one corner. I think in some of your larger pieces, there's at least five or six individual paintings within one large one. That's yeah. how I like to look at it. But you also paint over your canvases a lot and layer underneath your work. Do you want to talk a bit about that? I know this one in particular, you said it has a completely different piece underneath it. Yeah, actually, the the, pa the painting that we're looking at right now, uh, Untitled, which is just a portrait uh, inspired by a really quick uh, pastel sketch that was no more than six by six inches, then exploded. Uh, the physical canvas that this is on actually had a whole painstakingly four month painting underneath of two based on a 16th century couple of friends making love. Um, and then I worked on that for like four months and one day just walked into the studio and just washed it with turpentine. 
Um, and then the painting that we're looking at now is applied with a heavy impasto, um, very textural and just very uh, executed quickly, quite the opposite of how the original work underneath was. And um, I'm really interested in that pentimento of layering and, and you know, the underneath structures of paintings. You know, you can look at works uh, from the blue period like Picasso or toulouse lautrec's works, um, the very light washing of and it's almost like these, you know, going back to like the first question, like mythologies and stories, because I think those pentimentos really hold those stories that you can only find in the studio. You know, it, it creates that intimacy with the artist. And it's always funny when you watch co uh, converse, um, videos, preservation videos, you know, for example, like the Met or MoMA, they do the x-rays and they find, you always see the new article, like the x-ray unveiled never before seen painting underneath. And I think that's fun. You know, if I never shared the story that one day somebody would find those two paintings of two people making love. Yes, there's a lot of love that goes into your work. And I think you work really methodically, like, for instance, you starting off from a sketch and then turning it into a larger piece. And I feel like yeah. you do that for a lot of your works. And also you study and research a lot and really look to classical pieces and then do your own interpretations of them and like completely transform something before our eyes. Can you talk a bit about that and your process and research? I'm always fascinated with history. I mean, like for me, history is something that can constantly be sourced and there's always new histories coming up in, in our timelines now with the age of information. Um, and I think that is in a way something that we can use as a tool to help us answer questions that haven't been able to be answered looking forward in the future. So in reference to art or just uh, human history or world history, I like to look towards the past in a way to find a way to recreate a new future. It's like recycled material. And once it's going through my own personal creative lens, you know, then in, in itself through the process just becomes new. And one example is you know, the work on paper that I'm exhibiting at this beautiful booth, by the way, like the virtual layout is just amazing. Oh, um, yeah. I tried. <laughs> but yeah, that work on paper is like one of my favorite pieces. Um, the other half of my, my practice is based on like my ancestral connection being half Mexican and half Ecuadorian. I look to a lot of art from Mesoamerica and the Andes. So the work right there, the black and white uh, sketch or work on paper is inspired by a Tiwanaku um, sculpture that was a pottery that was utilized in an everyday uh, pre-Inca uh, pre civilization to just drink water. And it was beautifully painted and, and, and um, preserved. And now it's, I believe it's at the Met. Um, and I was just captivated by the geometrical pattern and how contemporary it was. You know, it's, I look at it and you can see, you know, it's something that you would see every day now, maybe in an interior design of a, a beautiful textile rug. But I also just was interested in the contour of, of, and the shape of the ceramic because it reminded me of the Paleolithic uh, Venus that is so like worldly renowned, you know, and going it back to that, uh, that history of contour and shape for the female form and, and you know, putting that into question and not just into question, but putting that at the forefront into like thinking at how it's seen, how it's viewed in, in its importance and its, in its consideration of beauty. Um, you know, I thought that was really interesting. Yes, I'm sure going to the museum is like a field day for you where you're looking at like the ancient artifacts and things and like thinking about how you can incorporate those into the work. So can you talk a bit about that? Like what draws oh, you yeah. specifically to something to want to recreate or reimagine it? I guess in my mind, like going to the question you asked me, like what's, what's reality? It's like, I guess when I walk into a museum that's uh, an encyclopedia museum, like uh, the Art Institute here in Chicago or the Metropolitan, you know, you walk from one gallery to the other, it's like time traveling. You know, I think that's really cool, conceptually time traveling. So I think that's really interesting that in our minds, you know, we can travel through these points in history. And I, and I like to think the idea of like going to an archeology span museum or a museum like the Field Museum here where you go to see the exhibition on the ancient Egyptian pyramids. And then, you know, to me, th those objects are just as much art as they are, you know, objects of history. 
Um, and I, I, don't, I think that's a very fine line and in my, in my imagination and in my practice, I like to blur that line and, and kind of find a way to show the visibilities um, of how similar they are. Yes, I love that too. And I, I love the comment about time travel. I love being able to kind of see what some of the earliest like art forms were like from going yeah. to the pyramids and seeing the carvings and stuff and those and like just really taking that all in and how how long people have been creating and making work and how we've evolved since then but yet so much is still the same I, well, I know I mean like if you think about it like the, the white space is just uh the new altars for worship it's, it's just the aesthetics different <laughs> You know, and I think that's an interesting story. And I, and I like to think that my work is in entirely modern, but ancient, you know, kind of connects those two spheres of, of humanity. Yeah, what I love too about your pieces is the texture. The other piece we were looking at, what I thought was really cool about the booth was that you can actually see the oil like on it yeah. up close. Like it's like you're looking at the piece in real time. And I know you've been experimenting with watercolor lately. Yes. And I'm curious about how that has affected your practice or how it's changed your hand or anything like that for the other types of work that you do. Well, I well the work behind me is just from a year ago and I worked exclusively with acrylic for forever and um now I'm exclusively working in oil paint because I believe, you know, oil really tells the truth of what the art, from art making and the hand of the artist, you really can't hide too much from oil paint. Um, and with working re recently with watercolors, it allows me to kind of create just more control in the layering process, you know, and building the foundation of the forms and, and, and like that. And then comparatively acrylic and oil don't communicate the same but watercolor and oil paint is you know they're like brothers and sisters they really do um, work in similar fashion you can either get a lot opacity by going straight from the tube or you can dilute it you know in with solvents if you were talking about oil or water and then that way you can work very softly and I think that's what's really nice about working with oil paint especially like high pigmented paint with an oil and water color that you get these beautiful softness but then you can also get like this very hard impasto rigidity you know if we look to the work that we were looking at prior there's a heavy impasto mark making not only from brushes but you know just from a pigment stick so there's that virtuosity that you would get from like a Tuambli or like a Jean-Michel Basquiat. Yes, I love that. And I love seeing how the work evolves and what you've been working on, you've been sharing. We do have a show coming up with Marcelo this fall, which I'm super excited about at Compound Yellow in Chicago. And this is your first solo show in I think two years, you said? Three years. I haven't had a solo show in three years. Wow. So how are you feeling? You I'm ready? Excited. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm um, especially the fact that you're curating, so I'm excited to see what you're going to pick. Uh, I'm also in the works uh, working with a non-for-profit space here in Chicago called Belong Gallery. We've just set up a couple meetings working on an exhibition there. Brand new space, only second show in. Um, great not-for-profit. Artists get 100% of the proceeds. Definitely recommend that. Well, that's check crazy. that out. <laughs> yeah, unheard of. Usually, cool. Unheard of at all. <laughs> but also, well, I just want to say thank you to everybody. You know, thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Sierra. Oh, thank you, Marcelo, for joining us today and for doing the work that you're doing. Super excited for what's to come. All right. Thank you. Look. And we'll definitely send out um, to all kind of the audience the the links and um, to your profiles. And then also the recording will be up on YouTube. And I know there's another tour starting in 10 minutes but if everyone wants to jump back on for a second in case any of the audience have questions before we say goodbye um we can definitely have time for uh there is the chat button at the bottom of the screen in case anyone in the audience would like to type a question um briefly before uh we head out Or not. <laughs> Could also share uh, information like your Instagrams and different pages. So feel free to reach out to everyone directly. And um, Marcelo said this, all the artists said this, but thank you so much for curating such a beautiful booth. Um, the way you've hung the work and 
you know, the conversations you've drawn between all the artists work together, the color, the detail in the recordings, the playlists, the programming for tonight for our Friday Late. It's a wonderful booth and it captures virtually the energy and joy of AMFM. Yeah, we've loved working with you the last few years, Sierra. It's been so much fun and, and really excited to be able to continue our partnership in this yeah. virtual sphere as well. You yeah. always do such an amazing job. Oh, thank you so much. I'm going to miss like giving out my pink cassette. Tape. I know the pink cassettes. <laughs> I saw that in your booth and I got so excited. I was like still keeping that going. Oh, it's been a pleasure. I think we do have a question from yeah. someone. They want the artist to name an artist who has inspired you. Share their song from the playlist. Yeah, what's their favorite song from the playlist? Kendrick Lamar. I think my song was um, a song by Goth Babe, and it was just a song that I love to drive through the mountains listening to. <laughs> so it set a vibe. So one of the um, bands I picked was Boards of Canada. Really I kind of- a lot of Boards of Canada in college. I was super yeah. nervous and happy to see that. A lot of visual color in the mind. Yeah, I was playing with my partner when we were driving around and trying to have her guess which artist picked which mm -hmm. song and she was spot on for, for folks. That's such yeah. a fun game. <laughs> Yeah. So if you know the artist and you know their vibe, you can definitely pick up on it. And I'm super excited for tonight because we have uh, we're taking over the YouTube channel and we're having a DJ set from Kali B, who's an awesome, awesome artist who um, runs this brand called Afro Bang and does a lot of like Afro beats and global music. So I'm excited to, to be with him a little bit later so we can cheers and toast to the fair together. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, thank you all for joining and we'll see some of you later. Yes. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day.